everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organisers for um, having me here tonight. And um, thanks to the audience for um, coming together on International Women's Day, which is a very special day for all of us. Um, my name is Sam, and um, um, for the past three years, I've been running a group called Manchester Girl Geeks. But before I start talking about that, I would like you to meet someone. Um, meet my mum. Uh, my mum is a, a vegetable farmer, um, and actually so is the rest of my family. So I come from a family of farmers, landscapers, gardeners. Um, I have chosen a slightly different career path for myself. I'm just about to finish a PhD in computer science. Now, you might perhaps uh, think, how the hell did she get there? Um, and let's just go back uh, about 15 years in time, back in the 90s. Um, I was just a 12-year-old girl and um, I was reading a t one of those teenage magazines about my favourite band, I had my favourite band on the cover, and I was reading the article and at the bottom of the article it said something about a website and you could find out more about your favourite band on my website and I thought, ooh, that sounds exciting. I didn't exactly know what it meant, I didn't have a computer at the time, internet wasn't a big thing back in, uh, in the late 90s in rural Germany. Um, but I knew that uh, my stepdad had a computer in his room, and um, I, so I just went up to him and said, uh, Chris, um, there's something about a uh, website, um, can, you, can you tell me how to go online and go on the internet and go on that website and try and have more about my favourite band, because I really want to. And he said, well, okay, that's fine, I'll, uh, I'll show you how it works. So I went to his room, sat in front of a computer, went online, uh, back in the day, so it was still 56k dial-up modem, and, uh, and looked at the website, and I clicked around, and I thought it was fantastic to sort of um, find out more information about my favourite band. I went in the chat room and talked to, to, talked to people about it, and I absolutely loved it. So um, pretty shortly after that, I went back online, and... Um, I went back online, and little did he know, he got me absolutely hooked. Um, I spent a lot of time on his computer. As soon as I told the boys in my class that I was using a computer, they started giving me computer games. So um, I kind of just hogged my stepdad's PC um, for quite a while. And one day, he said to me, well, that's all great. Uh, it's really good that you're enjoying using his computer so much, but can I please have my computer back now? <laughs> And I said, well, yeah, but I really, I really like this. And he said, well, okay, I see you're enjoying this. I see, you know, you're having, you're having lots of fun with it. So how about I get you your own computer? And I said, yeah, 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 I want a computer, awesome. Um, the only condition was, he told me, I had to build that computer myself. <laughs> um, I was 12 year old at the time, and I thought, uh, okay, I have absolutely no idea how this works but I really wanted a computer. So I said, okay, what could possibly go wrong? Um, yeah, okay, well, I'll build a computer. So I went to a shop, bought loads of components, went back home, and for an afternoon I was just sat on the floor building my big grey desktop machine um, with my mum's partner, sat in his chair, chain smoking, and just pointing at things whenever I asked him for advice. Um, and that moment, and that afternoon where I built my own computer really shaped my perception of computers as something that you just take apart, you, you, you put back together, you install operating systems. If you don't like it, you install the different operating systems, you install software, you can just do whatever you want with it. Now, um, why am I telling you about this? Um, why am I telling you about how I got my first computer? Well, after this, um, I, I started, um, I, I spent a lot of time online and um, pretty quickly I, I wasn't just satisfied with just looking at websites or playing games. I wanted to build my own websites because I thought, hey, I've got amazing things to share, I've got great things to tell the world, I've got photos and funny stories and whatever. So um, I wanted to build my own website and again I went to my stepdad and said, I want to build a website, how do I get stuff online? And uh, he happened to have a book about HTML in his bookshelf, and well, being the first year, he just said, here's a book, teach yourself. Um, so off I went with a book about HTML when I was about 12 or 13 years old, and I just read through it and started building my own website. And that kind of just went on, um, and for me, when it came to, 
just choosing what I wanted to do at university, it was an absolutely natural choice to do something with computers. So I did a degree in media informatics. Um, I got really interested in advanced computer science, uh, in, in theoretical computer science. So uh, I went on to do a master's in computer science, and now I'm here doing a PhD in computer science. So for me, it was a fairly natural um, progression, really. Now, at some point, uh, when I went to university, um, I found myself in a room with 120 people, and about 10 of those were girls, or women. So, uh, at some point I realised I was a bit of a special case. Um, and in fact, I think we're all aware of it. I think we all know that there aren't that many women or girls who are into computing. And just to give you some ideas of uh, the situation in the UK today, um, only about 9% of A-level computing students are girls. In fact, in Northern Ireland last year, only four girls took A-level computing. Four girls. Um, only 13% of um, undergraduate students uh, in computing and computer science are female. So it wasn't just my personal experience, it's just a general um, issue. About 18% of the, of the uh, IT workforce are female. And if you look into um, free and open source software development, only about 1.5% of people who contribute to open source software are female. So where are the women? Now, you might think, okay, well, there just aren't that many women. What's the problem? Why, why, is, why is that a problem? And um, there are two issues, really, with this. Um, there's one very practical reason. There's a skill shortage. There's a massive skill shortage in the UK. Um, Helen is going to talk about this later as well. Um, there just aren't enough trained people to fill all the positions there are in IT. To give you an, an, an idea of what I'm talking about, I'm talking about, about 129,000 jobs in IT every single year, according to the eSkills UK report. Um, so that's about half to a third of all um, students who graduate from university um, every single year. So there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of jobs, and a lot of careers that girls are potentially missing out on. And this is actually doing harm to the British industry. Uh, economy, sorry. Um, the second reason, which I find a lot more important, which I'm very, very passionate about, is that technology shapes our world. A world that is 50% female. And I feel really strongly about the fact that we just sit here and just take it for granted that women just aren't into technology and they just don't contribute into te to technology for something that is as important in our lives as technology. From the moment you get up in the morning to the, day you go, uh, to the moment you go to bed in the evening, there's banking, transport, healthcare, shopping, food, just anything, there has been some kind of technology involved. And we can't just sit here and let this happen without girls and women getting involved in shaping our world. Now you might think, well, maybe girls just aren't into it. Maybe they're just not interested in it and they don't want to do it and they don't like technology. But we all know that's not true, right? We all know we use technology every single day. And um, women and girls are actually really active users of technology. So 45% of girls aged 7 to 15, so very young girls, use a smartphone every single day. 50% of women play online games. 51% um, of all laptop buying decisions are made by women. And 58% of Facebook users, so the biggest social network in the world, 58% are female. So women are very, very active users and consumers of technology in all, in all sorts of ways. But they're not creators. They don't get involved in creative technology. And that's something that I find quite scary, that women consume technology in such amounts, but they're not involved in creating it. And what I want to see is girls and women getting involved in becoming creators and shaping our world. And that kind of goes back to um, what I mentioned at the start, the work I do with Manchester Girl Weeks. So for the past three years, I've been 
very passionate about this topic and I've been working very hard to get more girls and women really interested in technology. And um, I think one of the things we do with our events, we run what we call girly tea parties on Sunday afternoons and we make these events things that you would like to do on a Sunday afternoon. We focus on science, technology, engineering, mathematics, but in a way that you would really enjoy doing on a Sunday afternoon. So if I came up to you, even if you're really interested in maths, for example, and I came up to you and said, would you like to sit in the classroom on a Sunday afternoon and do some maths? You'd probably say, well, well no, no, thank you. Um, if I came up to you and said, well, would you like to sit in a room with 20 or 30 other women, drink tea, eat cake, build some giant mathematical shapes out of thousands of train tickets while listening to the Mandelbrot song and chatting to other girls, you'd probably say, yeah, that sounds fun, okay, let's do it. And that's exactly what we do with Madison Sagogi. So um, we run workshops, for example, that are called Mathematical Origami. And I didn't just make that up. Mathematical Origami is an actual thing. Um, so here we built a huge um, Benga sponge, which is a fractal that's a mathematical shape, out of train tickets. We also do lots of coding. Um, we do uh, software development, for example, on Raspberry Pis, uh, on Arduinos, so any kind of hands-on uh, computing. If you listen to BBC Woman's Hour, um, which some of you do, I presume, um, you might have heard her on the radio a few weeks ago. That's Amy, our little superstar. Um, she, she was interviewed by Jenny Murray of BBC Woman's Hour about being a girl who's into technology. We also do lots of electronics. We quite love our electronics and we do lots of soldering. We solder uh, flashy LED badges. And uh, we do Morse code workshops as well, so we learn how to build Morse code telegraphs, which is a great way to learn binary, by the way, um, but by making something bleep and making lots of noise and making quite a lot of mess as well. Um, this is a picture um, that someone has drawn for us. Uh, I'll just read it out. It says, Kappa, I created it. And this is a picture of it. Love from Effie. And I created it at Girl Geeks. So uh, that's one of our attendees, Effie. She was four at the time. Uh, her mum, um, her mum, uh, Emma, just brought her along. And uh, she, she built a Morse code telegraph, and she was quite fascinated by what we call the tapper. So the thing that actually uh, makes the connections so of bleeps. And um, Emma said she just found that in Effie's notebook sometime after the event. Um, so uh, I would like to think that we made quite a lasting impression on some of the girls. Now, Manchester Girl Geeks is entirely run by volunteers. So I'm not trying to sell anything here. Um, and we just, re we just do it because we're really passionate about it. We haven't got any kind of schedules. We haven't got, got any kind of guidelines on how to do things. We really just run events that we think the girls would enjoy. And um, just to summarize our approach and to give you some thoughts, what I think um, is the reason for the success of our events. So we've been running them for the past three years um, and every single month they are filled up to capacity. So we've got 30 to 40 um, girls and women of all ages there. And just to give you some, some ideas of what I think um, makes those events so successful, um, the most important thing really is um, make it fun. Make, make those events fun. Don't say, let's go and sit down and do, and do, some, do some maths or do some science. That doesn't sound particularly interesting, right? Make it fun, but don't make it a big deal. And that goes back to my own experience as a kid. Um, my, my stepdad didn't make it into a big deal. Oh, you're going to build a computer, but you're a girl. Wow, that must be difficult. Um, he, he just said, just, you know, just do it. That's fine. And that actually takes me to my second point. Um, which I find really important, is just do it. Don't worry about breaking stuff. And you really need to tell the kids, just do it, just try it. Um, one of my favorite things to say when girls ask me, um, what happens if I, if I do this, or what happens if I do that? Um, I usually just say, well, just try it. What could possibly go wrong? Um, I advise you to use that one in moderation then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the last one is, really important if you work with girls is failure is an option. It's absolutely fine if something doesn't work, 
It's fine if you blow some LEDs. It's fine if your code doesn't run the first time. Girls like to say, oh, I'm not good at this, so, oh, I suck at math. So, and I'm pretty sure there's some people here in the room who say, oh, I'm just not good at math. Oh, I'm just not good at computers. That's not the right approach. That's not going to get girls to stand up and say, OK, I might have failed this time, but I'm just going to try until I succeed. So I think one of the most important points really to tell girls is to say, failure is an option. It's absolutely fine. It doesn't mean you're not good enough. It just means you've got some more opportunities to try. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you very much.